Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the fifth of our series of lectures. And so today I'm going to talk about fluorescent spectroscopy, and at the end, then microscale thermophoresis. So we're, we're having a bit of a switch now from the previous lectures were about microscopy, and the next couple of lectures, then we're going to be talking about um, what biophysics facility can do for you. So there's lots of questions that um, people kind of come to us and ask, and we've got lots of different techniques to try and tackle those kind of questions. But today we're going to look at fluorescence and to be able to look in questions of affinity, looking like screening from atomic instability. And at the end, then we're going to talk about microscale thermophoresis to look at affinity. So overall, I'm going to you know, go into the depth of the process of, of fluorescence because to understand the basics is very important to understand what to look for in controls. We'll look at several applications for stability, binding studies, kinetics, and fret. And at the very end, we'll look at MST. So first of all, we, we have to think about light and energy. At the top, the top corner there, you can, you can see, here it goes, that uh, light is, is then related to the wavelength of, um, of the light. And so when that interacts with matter, then that can cause um, a whole lot of different things depending upon what the energy is. So, you know, microwaves can, can, can cause uh, rotational transitions. And of course, you know, infrared spectroscopy, you're looking at vibrational transitions, you would come across that in chemistry. And, you know, in physical and ultraviolet light, then we get these electronic transitions in the outer shell. And then we go to X-ray, then we're looking at lots of energy and transitions within the inner shell then. So if we want to have a look at the, I've used visible and ultraviolet light, we're looking at these electronic transitions in the outer shell. And fluorescence occurs in this kind of region and it involves aromatic compounds where you can get five to five transitions, but also the lanthanides as well, these metals um, can also undergo fluorescence. And obviously in proteins, there's lots of different fluorescent groups, um, either amino acids or by conjugation of amino acids then in, in GFP, and then there's lots of extrinsic fluorophores, and you can look at Ben's talk for, for how, how to label proteins. All right, first of all, let, let's think about light interacting with matter. Well, in these electronic transitions, you get light coming in, and that gives it the, the electrons and energy to go up to um, higher energy states. Then there, there might be a, a tumble down uh, just to vibrational, uh, to lower states. And this, this happens really, really quickly in you know, 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So the excited state is, is happening uh, very quickly, but you know, they're only very short-lived at these top energy levels. Then when you, you get an electron, then it turns, uh, going from that excited state down then down to the ground straight state, then you get energy released in terms of, of light. And because there is a, you know, a specific energy difference between all these different energy levels, then there is going to be a, a distribution of the wavelengths of light coming off. And that reflects the, uh, the vibrational level states here. And this typically happens over about the nanosecond time frame. So if we look at a, a spectrum, an emission and excitation spectrum, we can see here that at shorter wavelengths, then we excite and get the electron up. And then when it falls back down again um, at longer wavelengths, then you get emission light here. And this, this difference between uh, the excitation of shorter wavelengths and emission at longer wavelengths is called Stokes shift. And if you're in Cambridge and if uh, you happen to go into Pembroke College, then have a look in the chapel because there's a stained glass window uh, to Gabriel Stokes who was here in Cambridge and did lots of exciting work on fundamental work on light. And one thing to kind of, uh, you know, kind of be aware of that, you know, if you've got, you know, very, very close emission and excitation um, emission uh, wavelengths here, you can, you can actually excite um, the, the, the electron at a much shorter wavelength, which is, is then going to be further away from the excitation, because essentially you're going to get it up to a higher state, but then it, the, the, you'll still get the same um, fluorescence emission. But what comes up doesn't necessarily always come down the same way. And so you can get other things that happen during fluorescence, such so you can get uh, quenching and due to collision. We'll come on later to look at energy transfer. Um, there may be bleaching to non-fluorescent um, 
species, and also there might be a conversion um, to a, another kind of state um, where you, you know where you get uh, phosphorescence. Uh, so not all fluorophores are equally bright. We can kind of kind of measure kind of how bright things are by this term called quantum yield, and that's really the number of electrons that are emitted over the uh, number of electrons that are absorbed, and that really depends upon the not only the uh, the rate of its transfer down, but also the rate of this uh, non-radiative dissipative uh, uh, process where you know energy is, is, is gone somewhere else and you don't get any fluorescence. So the important thing is that not all fluorophores are equally bright. Right. So why, why do we tend to use fluorescence? Why is it really good for lots of different things? Well, you're looking at, you're proving the electronic transitions in the outer shell of, of these fluorescent groups. It's, so it's very sensitive to the environmental change. You know, there's very fast response in the nanos, nanosecond range. It's very sensitive. You can get down to picomolar or micromolar sensitivity. Um, it's very selective because you were only looking at, say, one kind of group. Um, you can use, you know, such as intrinsic fluorescence groups, or you can specifically label something with, with something like a uh, fluorophore here. And it should be reproducible as long as you don't get uh, fluorescence quenching and bleaching. So let's first of all kind of look at intrinsic protein fluorescence. Now here's the different kind of groups that you get. Uh, they're all aromatic. Um, they've got different absorbance uh, patterns. And with then a difference between absorbance between say tryptophan and, and tyrosine, then, um, you know, you, at, at two, if you excite at say 295, you'll mostly hit the tryptophans. But it tends to be that, um, you know, that, that uh, phenylalanine really, you don't really tend to use it for fluorescence because the, the quantum, quantum yield is very, very low. But, so you will see protein fluorescence through tyrosine tryptophans. And so typically, you know, the excitation may be around 305. And for tryptophan, then it might be about 350. But this can all change given the environment of the, of the tryptophan. So it's quite solvent sensitive. So imagine if you um, have it in a, say, a hydrophobic region, um, say inside a protein. And what happens is that it, as, as that is, is moved out into the solvent, then you're going to get a red shift in the maximum. Um, so this fluorescence is, is also then uh, dependent upon temperature, you can have changes in pH, and also quenchers such as oxidine, iodine, and acrylamide. Uh, and those historically were used then for, for probing solvent accessibility of, of different groups. Right, so let's have a look at uh, fluorescence uh, techniques. So the first one um, to illustrate how sensitive fluorescence can be is, is using um, the studies of denaturants with uh, proteins uh, to look at their stability. So you can imagine, um, uh, say, a, a protein here, and if you add, say, these small denaturants such as rhea or guanidinium, at a certain concentration, they'll start to unfold the protein. And when the protein then unfolds, these hydrophobic groups here, the, the tryptophans or tyrosines are then going to be exposed to the solvent. And what you'll see in terms of the emission of the fluorescence, um, in some cases, upon denaturation, look at a change in, in, the, in the max, but also um, a large change um, in the fluorescence uh, yield. So we can use this as, as a reporter between the, the native and the unfolded state. Um, we could take all the wavelengths, or if we just looked at, say, one wavelength, and looked how that fluorescence changed with the nature and concentration. And what we see is then we've got folded protein here, and then we get into a transition region um, where there's both uh, folded material and unfolded material, because this, this protein just folds in a, a two-state mechanism. And then we reach up to high concentrations of the where it's just unfolded material. So if we, if we try and analyze this data, well, we can we know that well the the fluorescence of the native seems to have a linear dependence upon denaturing concentration, and similarly then for the unfolded, it's got a linear dependence. But what happens in the middle here? Well, this fluorescence is just going to be due to the, the fraction that is of the fluorescence molecules that are in native, and the fraction of of 
of proteins that are in the unfolded state um, with the unfolded fluorescence. And also we want to, to probe this, this equilibrium constant between unfolded and, and native. So we know that obviously the, the fraction of the native and the unfolded must equal to one. And so that then if we go into if put that into the equilibrium constant here and similarly for the unfolded. And this uh, equilibrium constant then is linked to the free energy through the gas constant and the temperature in Kelvin. And let's rearrange that um, into the exponential. And so can we then substitute in all this into to kind of link the fluorescence to the um, unfolding energy? Well, we can do because um, it was found that there was a, a linear dependence upon the uh, denaturing concentration and the energy, such that <clears throat> when you get to 50% of uh, the proteins being denatured, that means that the, the free energy is going to be equal to zero. And this uh, uh, delta G zero is going to be equal to uh, this uh, M constant times the concentration where 50% of the molecules are unfolded. So let's just, I mean, don't worry really about the details here, but what we're doing is we're changing the fluorescence against then the uh, a function of the native material and the unfolded material. Um, and we need to then uh, put in the linear for the unfolded and the, so the unfolded and folded against the equilibrium constant. And then this equilibrium constant, you can substitute this in um, to get an equation here. Don't worry about the details. That we're just then linking um, the fluorescence signal at one wavelength against the denaturing concentration, um, which will then give us the energy of this unfolding. Well, why do we want to, to look at the energy of the unfolding and the stability? Well, if we imagine then uh, what can mutations do? So if we think about this energy diagram here where this uh, unfolded material um, is, um, is then going through a transition to the native state, which is a lower, um, a lower energy. Um, so you know, on an equilibrium position, then the majority of the, the protein will be a native. If we start to destabilize this native state, um, um, then what could happen then is we, we could partially um, on, unfold some of the molecules. Um, and if we stabilize uh, the native state by mutation, then uh, we'll find that really there's, there's more and more uh, of the proteins in the native state and probably much less in, in the unfolded state. So th this is a, an example here from the Saki lab um, where they were looking at missense mutations in, the, in BRCA1, which obviously is involved in breast cancer and in, in these BRCT domains. And there's lots of missense mutations and they could look at then what the change in stability would be and they find that uh, some of the mutations there really didn't have any effect on the stability. Um, some of them uh, were destabilizing and a few were stabilizing. And of course, what would have meant that if, if there's uh, enough uh, destabilizing uh, change, then it means that the uh, more of the protein will be on the unfolded state. And obviously then it won't be able to do its job. So here's another way to, to look at unfolding and that's by using uh, thermal unfolding. So you just heat the protein up and you look at it um, by when it comes to natured and we can find what the, the temperature um, of melting is. And uh, this is, is used in screening where if you, if you find some conditions or a small molecule that binds onto the folded state, then that can easily then uh, move this equilibrium across by just by mass action and, and apparently stabilize uh, the, the unfolding to, firm, uh, uh, to firm unfolding. And then you can do that to screen for hits to binders. And one of the ways we can do this with an intrinsic protein fluorescence is by using Prometheus from Nanotemper. And it's essentially a perimeter where you load your samples um, in uh, these little uh, these capillaries here, which is uh, on a mirror. And this has got very, very good uh, thermal from coupling here. So you have very small samples, 48 samples in parallel. You know, you're looking at the intrinsic protein fluorescence. So depending upon how fluorescence you're putting will then depend upon how much protein you actually need. You can use detergents, membrane proteins. Um, we'll look at the backscatter um, in a minute. So imagine that you, you take a protein and you unfold it 
so you know similarly to say um, uh, if you say to nature something then you might in this in this case here you might see that the fluorescence will go down but what happens uh, when you when you heat the fluorescence with temperature will actually go down and if we look at the unfolded uh, uh, so if we, if we look at the unfolded material here the fluorescence is going down with temperature and that's just a, a function of the nature of fluorescence if you look at the native material here, then we can see it, the fluorescence is higher. And then at a certain point, then you get a transition down to the region where it's all unfolded. So it's, it, that's quite difficult to actually analyze because there's, there's multiple things happening here. This is kind of slope and there's another slope. And so what the, the Prometheus does is it, it takes uh, the fluorescence change then at two wavelengths and look at, looks at their ratio. So we can see here then this is at uh, zero uh, you know, native conditions with no urea in there. Then we can, this is the slope um, at 350. And here's the slope here at uh, 330. And you can see that there's both a, a transition here. So if we take the ratio of these two, then we will, we will get a folding transition here, which, which, which is much easier to see. And you can analyze then by the first derivative just, just to see then where the melting temperature is. Um, so therefore, I mean, one use for it is, is to, to, to screen, you know, well, what is your, is your protein happy in, in a different buffer or different salts? Or what happens if you put an organic solvent in, such as DMSO? And you can see here the different transitions. And you can see that, well, you know, we're changing buffer here between PPS and TRIS. There's, just, there's a slight difference. But if you put in 10% DMSO, then it melts at a much lower temperature. So because it's, uh, it's all the capillaries are sitting on this mirror, then you can, can also um, use backscatter. So imagine that um, you, know, you shine kind of light down through there, just normal light, and then that will reflect back. But if you start to get aggregates there, what will happen then is is the light when we'll get scattered. And so uh, much less of the light will come back. And so this, this will, uh, Prometheus will also analyze this data. So what you'll see is, okay, here's the ratio of the fluorescence changing. This is the unfolding. And then this is the scattering. And you can see this is a transition happening here slightly later. And if we can see that in the, in the first derivatives. And of course, what is then happening is of course the, the protein's unfolding and then the unfolded material is, is then aggregating. So of course, this really means that this transition here is maybe not, not reversible and this is, may not be an equilibrium. So um, see Chris's talk later on in the series then for, for light scattering uh, techniques in much, much more detail. So here's an example um, of using the Prometheus uh, from the Leo James lab. And they were looking at HIV uh, capsid, particularly then, um, these hexamers on the surface where they could see that there was this pore that could open and close. And this may be, you know, very, very uh, important for, um, for the virus then to import lots of nucleotides to start the process of, of synthesizing its, its genome before the capsule completely um, disintegrates. And um, so what they, what, they, what they thought, they could see these groups here, and obviously hexagonal, and they thought, well, can we block this pore? So they had these uh, multiply substituted benzenes and they expressed in the hexamer um, in E. coli in solution and, and seen what would happen when you put these uh, substituted benzenes in. So in blue here is just the uh, hexamer by itself. And then as you add in these, these different substitutions, you can see the more substitutions you get in, then the more stability you, you get then. Um, right up to then the, uh, the hexa substituted, um, as you see here in green. So that means that you're, you're stabilizing that pore um, in um, more and more really as, as you bind across it. So something that, that people tend to forget um, about um, in terms of using fluorescence is you can actually use fluorescence, the native, the native fluorescence uh, quenching to look at uh, binding. Um, here is a case of uh, the ATP is chaperone HSP90, which binds ATP. And when ATP binds in, the, in this white cleft here, then you get, um, an in, you get a, a change then in 
in the fluorescence, you get quenching. And um, if we excited 295, then kind of avoid absorbance of, of the nucleotide, and we can start to look at the, uh, the binding. And in this case, then what we could see is then when you actually add more ligand in, in this case, it's non hydrolyzable analog, uh, you can see that there's more and more fluorescence quenching. So we could fit this and to get this binding constant. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that the change in the fluorescence is then going to be proportional to the amount of complex we form. And so we need to solve this, this, this equation here. This is these are the free protein, the free ligand, and this is the complex. And so we need to know then how much of, of the protein then is in complex. And what we're going to assume is that um, the amount of ligand is, is going to be uh, much, much greater than, than the protein, such that then that really the, 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 the ligand concentration isn't really going to be changed that much when, it, when you get a complex formation. So essentially then that this axis here is essentially the same as the free. So we have made the assumption that the, the concentration um, of the complex is, is proportional to the, the change in fluorescence, and that when it reaches a maximum, that must be when all of the protein then is in, is in a complex. So that's going to be proportional then to the total amount of protein. We substitute these values into this equation here, and then just write it out. And we get a very, very simple kind of McKeels McKenton like um, equation where if you fit it, then you can get the KD. So if we want to look in more depth at say the kinetics of an, of an interaction, again, we can to, to tease out what the intrinsic rate constants of the on rates and the off rates, then we need to go to a much faster time frame. Um, and to do this, we can use stop flow. Uh, in this case, you've got uh, two syringes here where you've got two reactants. So this could be the protein and this could be the ligand. And this is gonna be then driven in through a mixer in through um, a cell where you can look at absorbance of fluorescence. And then the solution is going to go all the way uh, through to the stop syringe so that, you know, as soon as you kind of hit this drive in, you will drive liquid, a bit of liquid all the way through, it'll hit the stop and you'll start recording. And this could be at the millisecond time range. And you can look at the fluorescence crunching here, fit it to an exponential and uh, look at the residuals and then get this observed rate constant and then start to then tease out what these individual rate constants are. Another way of, of say looking at uh, say enzyme kinetics would be to use a reporter. In this case, um, we're going to look at the ATPase rate by looking at the release of, of organic phosphate. And the reporter we're going to use is this phosphate binding protein uh, produced in E. coli, which is then being uh, uh, labeled specifically with this Cumarin, um, which will report upon a conformational change when phosphate binds in between these two domains here. And what you get is you get a huge increase in, in the fluorescence. And if you just take some inorganic phosphate, you can then titrate in this fluorescence to get a standard curve. And if you just look in, in say, this, this first portion, which is almost linear, um, you can then use a change in fluorescence to then correlate that to a change in phosphate. And then, so therefore, phosphate release you can get an initial rate of the enzyme and then go and do a mechanism some kind. Right, let's uh, switch now to extrinsic fluorophores. So I'm going to do some labeling. So the first one is again, looking at uh, protein denaturation, but instead of looking intrinsic, we're going to add in a dye. Um, so in this case, it's gonna be cipro orange. And this dye will then bind on to hydrophobic groups that are exposed when, when the protein becomes unfolded. And the reason why uh, super orange is, is used is then its emission and, it, um, and excitation are just in the nice range for, for using qPCRs. And again, what you'll see upon, uh, upon unfolding and binding is you get a huge increase in the fluorescence emission. And there's uh, so in the qPCR here, like this Corvette, then it, you can use these kind of filters. And so what happens then as you unfold the protein with temperature is you get low fluorescence, 
and then it's routine and full you get binding and you get an increase in fluorescence you can fit this to find again what the tms are and then you can look at say buffer screening but also again small molecule um, screening so another another way of using fluorescence is, is to use changes in size um, in this case it could be something binding to something big or you could uh, look at a change uh, decrease in size by say here's diubiquitin being cleaved into a smaller smaller thing and we can take um, we can we can use fluorescence polarizations to look at changes um, in size so we'll need to kind of go through just a bit of the background of that first to kind of understand it okay so imagine that you are um, exciting a, a fluorophore um, with polarized lights you put it through a polarizer so it's it's the light is, is going in, in one polarized direction now when uh, this chromophore then is in the right direction right orientation then it will be absorbed then this light and then you can imagine that it maybe it's going to tumble and you know it, it may tumble quite fast so it might take just you know the correlation time would be one nanosecond and that again if you remember that's about the lifetime of of the fluorescence um, and so then when it when it emits then it might be in a different orientation for from where it was originally so the light that it emits then is going to be polarized in um, a different direction So in what we could say in this case is then that we've got a loss of the polarization from the original um, incident light. So imagine if you then bind something on, onto this molecule and um, change in size. Well, then the, the tumbling is going to be is going to be much, much slower, say 100, say 100 nanoseconds. So of course, that's you know much greater than the lifetime of the fluorescence. So within about one nanosecond. You know, you can imagine you're going to get a mission, but it hasn't really moved anywhere. So you're going to get a mission in, in really the same polarization plane as the incident light. So we can look at that in bulk. And so imagine then, uh, you know, again, you've got incident polarized light here, and the, the, you've got a whole cuvette of different solutions. So again, remember that um, only, only the fluorophores that are actually in, in the right orientation um, to the incident light will then be excited. Um, but because these are all tumbling, um, then um, you know, you're going to get uh, lots of different emissions here. But if you start to add in a binder, then you're going to then end up with much more of them then um, emitting in a, in a certain polarized uh, position. And to be able to measure this, then in, in perimeters, there's different ways of doing it. Um, it's some may be in this kind of T format, where you've got a polarizer here for the, uh, the, the vertical polarization. And you look at the fluorescence then either with a, a polarizer that's in, in the, that's in free vertically polarized light, or one that just lets in horizontally polarized light. And then as you get binding, uh, what's going to happen is that is, is then you're going to get this vertically polarized light and uh, the fluorescent light here is going to increase and then the horse then the the vertically polarized light which is the same as the incident one is then going to decrease and so that the uh, the anisotropy really is, is another way of, of terming polarization um, then is is really a ratio of uh, the difference in these intensities these two intensities here um, over really what uh, the, uh, the sum of all the, all the light. Um, so polarization uh, is, is commonly is, is commonly used, and I've been talking about polarization as well. And again, you see this often enough um, published here. Um, but you can see that the only real difference between um, polarization and anisotropy is then is this this this, uh, this uh, two times here and and so that you know you can convert uh polarization to anisotropy just with this equation here 
But it's important to remember that actually it's only anisotropy that's actually directly proportional mm -hmm. um, to the binding um, because this takes care of all the incident light. So it's always good to uh, convert then if you've got, if your plate reader then uh, measures in polarization to then uh, convert it into anisotropy. And there may be a, a slight shift then in what your reported KD is. So because uh, things aren't, aren't perfect in perimeters, then um, a lot of things uh, you, would, you would have to do would be take, take care of, of just slight missing orientation then of, of the polarizers. And this is called uh, the grading factor. And then that essentially just is there as a correction factor. And so, I mean, it's, it's very important that you, you do that and also that you, you can kind of uh, you know, establish that, that grading factor. But in plate readers, um, what certainly the uh, ones that I've seen, then it's very important to make sure that you're starting off with the right polarization. A lot of the times, uh, certainly the ones in the Ferris star will have a default um, calibration of 35 uh, milli p um, because it's it's there for a small small drug, um, but that might not be what the, the polarization is of your protein that's been labeled, or or you know your DNA or whatever. So it's it's always always important to calibrate with either free dye or measure your um, your system then in, in a perimeter to actually get um, the right uh, polarization value. So um, also check um, that you know if there's any buffer, make sure there's, there's no buffer uh, components you know, changing the, the uh, polarization. Okay, so. In terms of, of thinking about, well, what fluorophores should actually use to label uh, for looking at polarization? Well, this polarization is really a competition. You could almost think about, you know, against the, the time uh, for this uh, fluorescence, you know, we, we talked about it was in that kind of nanosecond, the time frame against the, the tumbling. And so there's this Perrin equation here, which, which, which denotes what, what the anisotropy is going to be. And, that, and so this tumbling constant here then depends upon the gas constant, the temperature, the viscosity, and this uh, mass volume effect, which depends upon the mass, uh, the also uh, the partial specific volume of the protein and the extent of hydration. And so what happens is as the mass increases, then um, R will, will we kind of reach a limit. And so for, for different fluorophores, then for different fluorescence lifetimes, then that will limit the mass range that you can actually look at. So you can imagine if, if you had a, a protein that was, was labeled with a fluorophore only had a one nanosecond time frame. Well, imagine if, you, if it was 20 kilodaltons. Um, so you can, you can see there that, well, really, you know, you, you're really, the, the labeled protein by itself has got a very high polarization. So if you come to bind something else on top of that, well, you've got a very, very limited range to, to look at kind of changes. You'd be much better off with, with say, something that's, that's maybe uh, got a, a different lifetime. And so as, as you change the lifetime of the, of the chromophore that you actually select, then you can look at a broader range of, of molecular weight changes. So how do we look at a binding constant? Well, again, here uh, we're looking at, say, a protein binding onto um, a labeled uh, a compound or uh, that's going to fluoresce. And so in this case, we're going to assume that, that the, the label compound really is either equal to or is slightly less uh, than the binding constant. And Here's the polarization. We're going to have an initial polarization and then we're going to have a saturation value. And in the middle, then we're going to have uh, the polarization is going to be equal to the, the initial. And then essentially the fraction of, of the uh, labeled material that's in a complex. And here's an equilibrium constant. And again, because uh, the, the, the labeled um, component then is, is either equal or just below the KD, then we can't make any assumptions um, that this, this protein will actually stay the same concentration. It won't be the same 
as the free concentration. So we need to take these into account, um, where you know the total amount of ligand, the total amount of protein, then um, equals to the free and the bound. And we need to solve that. Um, I'm using a quadratic here. So here, essentially, this is just a, a quadratic equation then to solve how much um, of, the, of the ligand um, is actually in a complex, given that we, we know what the total protein concentration is, the total ligand concentration is, and we know what uh, the first the first polarization is, and the initial and the end point. Here's an example from the uh, Passmore group. Now they're very interested in looking at um, mRNA uh, polyadenylation uh, degradation. And so they're looking at these complexes here and they want to understand uh, you know, why different mRNAs then are targeted, how they are targeted. So there's accessory proteins here, um, which have the low, plex, pl low uh, complexity region then binds onto the deadenylase. And they have an RNA binding protein with specific motifs here. So here's two, which have different uh, motifs. Um, we're going to look at their binding, not to labeled R. Um, we're going to look at uh, their, uh, their binding, um, these proteins binding onto labeled um, different RNAs here. So with uh, puff free, then it, you can see it binding onto its sequence here quite specifically. And it really doesn't bind onto the other sequence, the RE sequence. RNA for specifically just equally as, as, as well as it does just to, to, to poly A uh, with no specific sequence. And similarly with the other one, the, the ZFS, it has a specific a recognition of its sequence while you know, it's, it's pretty, uh, it, it'll bind on to the other PRE sequence equally as well as, as to poly A. You can use polarization high throughput screening. Um, um, so if you had a reporter uh, ligand that bound into an active site um, of an enzyme, then you would get an increase in the polarization and you've got a good signal window here. So that if you had this in, in, a, in a high throughput trait for it, um, well format, and you in each of these, and you, you, you took this complex and then added in a library of compounds in each of the wells, then you would look then for wells where um, you, you then um, didn't, you've got a decrease in the polarization. Um, and so you, you, you kind of got a polarization somewhere in the middle here. All right, let's uh, quickly look at uh, spectral rulers. So as, as I mentioned earlier on, then in fluorescence, it doesn't necessarily always uh, happen when you excite an electron and there's other ways for the energy to be transferred. So if you had two, two fluorophores here, here's BFP and GFP in the right orientation, then what might happen is that when you excite um, the blue fluorescent protein, that when you get an energy transition here from the excited type to the ground state, the energy then for dipole, dipole uh, interactions may transfer to the other system, um, such that this electron then gets excited up to the higher state, and then emits uh, fluorescence. And you can see then that this fluorescence is, is going to be, um, the gap here is much lower than here, so the fluorescence is gonna be at a longer wavelength. And again, you can see that these two systems, then the energy gap here is similar, but, and if we look, and we'll see that um, in, just, in just a second why that's important. Um, and so the amount of, of energy that's, that's transferred really um, is really, is really um, a ratio then of the, of the quanta that's transferred um, over the quanta that's absorbed. And then that's related to then this transfer rate plus then um, one over the uh, decay time uh, for the fluorescence. And then that is gonna be equal to then the amount of fluorescence um, um, when you have the donor and acceptor together over then the fluorescence when there's no transfer when you've got, just got the donor there. Now for this to happen then, we can see that the, 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 the two energy um, gaps are quite similar. And that means that the spectra are gonna be quite similar. So here's psi three, psi five, and this one here, you've got the, the absorption or the excitation spectrum. 
And then it will emit here in the stashed region here, and which goes on for quite a long time. Uh, and here is side five, then this is where it gets excited. So th this reports then on, on the energy profile yeah, states then for the excitation. And here in dark is where side five is going to emit. And you can see this region in the middle, then there's an overlap then between the psi free emission and the psi five excite, excitation. And in the, uh, the hash there, or not, in the stripy area here, then that's just as a percentage of the um, excitation. And um, I find this on this, on this website, it's a great resource. And this is, this is um, called uh, Furster Resonance Entry Transfer. And this was he, he looked at the first, and what he found was then that this uh, energy transfer is very dependent upon the distance between the two fluorophores. Um, and as you can see, it's, it, it kind of curves down. And when you get 50% of uh, efficiency of, of the um, energy transfer, this is called the, the, the first distance. And then that's dependent upon then uh, part of the sixth of of the distance between them and so if we, if we kind of then uh then plot that out um, as, a, as a linear uh, so in a log format you can see that you know you can use this then as molecular rulers and what this um this r value is is going to be different for different fluorophores and that's going to depend upon well the orientation of the fluorophores the refractive index um, and then the coupling, which is the overlap of the two spectrum and also the quantum yield. And for most then fluorophore uh, pairs that will fret, uh, sorry, they undergo fret, um, you'll get then, um, you can have a, an R naught then between 20 and 70. And um, if you have a look at this database, you can then check up um, on all the different pairs you can actually think of. So what's, what, use, what use is it? Well, you could simply measure distance. So imagine if you had a, a huge complex um, where you, you, know, you weren't sure you know, what the orientation of all the, all the different subunits were. Well, if you could label um, some of the subunits individually, then and if you got fret, then you would know that they would be within a certain distance. Obviously, you can, if you had uh, two different components um, labeled uh, separately, and if they came together and you got binding between them, then you, you might be able to see fret. Another thing as well is to use a conformational change. If you could label in two different uh, distinct regions of a protein with two different fluorophores that undergo FRET, if you've got a conformational change, then you might see FRET happening. So how do we measure? I mean, do you measure from the donor or the acceptor? Well, what happens is when you um, excite the, the donor is you're going to get some donor fluorescence. You're also going to get some uh, resonance transfer then to the acceptor and you'll see some acceptor. So what you see then in, in the spectra is you've got donor fluorescence here and you also got acceptor. So how do you calculate? Do you, do you look here between the, you know, the, the donor or the, um, or the acceptor fluorescence? Well, first of all, if you just look at the donor um, fluorescence, then what we need to do to calculate the the, uh, the, fret, the, the fret is we also we need to know then what the donor fluorescence would be in the absence of the acceptor. So in so here we go. Uh, so in the case here where you can see that there's no fret because there's no that um, there's no acceptor then to take that. So that then the 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 fret uh, energy efficiency then is is really just this ratio here. But it's also important to think about, well, you know, what de degree of labeling do I have on the acceptor? Because um, if say, you know, not all of your, um, your, your, your protein that is labeled with the acceptor is labeled, then, then obviously you're going to get more of uh, the donor fluorescence coming off because even though say the two components are close together and they could fret, you're not going to get fret because there, there isn't, some of them don't actually have the acceptor in that position. Okay, so from the acceptor position, um, it becomes a bit more tricky because you may then get um, fluorescence from the donor at the acceptor region. And also you may also get a bit of um, just 
um, acceptor um, for essence then when you um, just when you excite uh, to the the donor for essence. But of course, this is going to be much much smaller compared to you know when you excite directly at the acceptor excitation for essence. So, uh, so therefore, you know, if we if we correct after donor emission um, at the acceptor wavelength, then we we need to then take into account the extinction coefficient um, of the acceptor at the donor for essence excit excitation region, and also then we need to we look at the um, extinction coefficient then for the donor at the donor excitation. And you know, so then we're going to have this ratio of this fluorescence of the acceptor in the presence of the donor and in its absence. So we need ideally then both singly labeled components to be able to measure, to measure that. And also, again, of course, we need to take into account how much of the donor we've actually um, labeled. OK, here's uh, an example um, from the Chin Lab uh, where um, Chen Lab is, is, is interested in introducing non natural amino acids. And this was a test case here where in Calmodulin they could introduce two different non natural amino acids that were reactive to two different dyes. And these two different dyes then un underwent a threat. And so you can see this, this, this spectrum here. And of course, what happens if you denature this? Then, of course, the body is going to unfold. And then these two, these two uh, dyes are going to be moved much, much further apart. So, of course, what happens is then that the, the donor uh, fluorescence decreases because there's less threat. And then you get an increase in the fluorescence at the donor site. Right. So, um, you know, if, if you're going to use a fluorescence, then what should you use? Should you use a, a perimeter or a plate? Well, you know, in say perimeters, then you know you can use this kind of volume. Obviously, in plate-based methods, then you can use a lot less. Uh, perimeters are really good because you can get precise temperature control, um, while plate readers tend to be ambient. Now, the sensitivity of just using say uh, a perimeter, you know, maybe in the nanomolar range if you're lucky, um, but with plate readers, then under good conditions, then you can get picomolar. Uh, you know, perimeters tend to be you know much more flexible in terms of micrometers. While with uh, you know some uh, plate readers that we've got, certainly like the BMG, you need optical modules. And again, with perimeters, then in, in say in time, is is quite different. So see the biophysics website for those people who are internal um, to uh, for more information. Right. So practical tips. Just I mean, I'll just go very quickly through these. Um, because we want to really get onto uh, MST at the very end. Obviously, you want to avoid light scattering. So, you know, take care of buffers, aggregation, make sure it's clean, you know, make sure you've, you've got concentrations accurate, and, you know, obviously, you know, make sure you're not, you're not getting binding, you know, use plates, you can use specific non-binding non plates. Make sure you do good controls because, uh, you know, it's got a good signal change, are you in the right settings? You know, take care of you if you're getting floating bleaching over time. Is there an filter effect if you're adding in a ligand? And are you doing accurate titrations? You know, additional controls may be, you know, you're, if you're, say, labeling with a large fluorophore, you know, is that causing binding to your, your, your partner? You know, you can, you can test that with displacement reactions. You know, make sure you've got good temperature control. Okay, if you're looking at, at binding equilibrium binding, you know, have you reached equilibrium? Can you set up, measure, wait, uh, you know, for half an hour, an hour, two hours overnight? You know, are you reaching equilibrium? And, you know, data fitting, a whole different lecture series. We'll, we're going to talk about that later on. Please come to that. All right, so in the, la in the last kind of 10 minutes, then, we'll just talk about microscale thermophoresis. Okay, so we're very, very lucky in the LMB. We've just got uh, an update to our old machine. Uh, we've got a, a monolith. And this is uh, like the Prometheus, it's another capillary based, um, fluorescence based technique. Of course, you know, thermophoresis, what's that? You've come across electrophoresis, um, where you're moving um, of charges in electric field. Thermophoresis is movement then in a temperature, temperature uh, gradient, and that depends upon these, these different components, which we'll see in a second. And hopefully then this is this is going to show you a 
a movie here. And what is happening here is that a IR laser is, is then being fired onto these particles here. And then they're moving away from the hot source. And in this case, the next case, then we've got a laser heading about here. And then the particles are then moving towards the spot. And then that's negative thermophrasis. And so this, this partition between the, of concentration between hot and cold uh, depends upon the temperature difference and also this SORET uh, coefficient here. And this SORET then depends upon then changes in size or hydration shell or charges. So if any of these kind of three things change, then you're going to change then this distribution. So the, the, what the, the setup of the, the nanotemper is, it's got, everything is capillary. You've got an IR laser then being fired down. And then you're looking uh, through, uh, through and this dichromic mirror, looking at the fluorescence as well. And so there's an IR laser that heats up a, a little spot. So there's a big temperature gradient here. And we can use dyes in either the 488 or the 643, kind of the red and green regions. They supply lots of uh, different kits, um, but you can also do the labeling yourself. So what, is, what does a curve look like? Well, you have an initial state here. And so you get the fluorescence, which is just normalized. You heat, you get a temperature jump, you get thermophoretic movement out from the space mm -hmm. you're looking at. And then um, at the very end then, um, you are, are then uh, switching off the laser and then you get then diffusion back into the space. And so if you imagine in, these, in the, all these different uh, capillaries here, you have different, um, you know, say binding partner with the same concentration of label partner. Um, what could happen is you could get a change in the thermophoretic movement. Um, so that it, it changes our, I mean, you get the kind of saturation and kind of fit that. What also um, they found after many years was that there was also this, uh, there was a temperature change, uh, sorry, an intensity change related to temperature on the fluorophore in this first kind of section here, which you could then also fit and get very, very good binding data upon. And this, um, I mean, as, as we kind of talked before then, if you know the temperature change, you'll, you'll get an intensity decrease as we saw with the Prometheus. But also this could be affected by um, a proximity of say something binding nearby or also a conformational change as well. So when, when you fit then the data, then again, it's, again you're, it's like before with the polarization, you're, you're getting a, a quadratic to, give a, uh, a fraction of, of how much of the, the, the fluorescence component is in, in, a, in uh, the complex to then be able to, to get out what your KD is. And because you, you can you know, look at these three different you know, changes in size or sort of accessibility or, or charge, then MST is really applicable to just anything you can actually think about. You can actually try and we have tried and we, we have got changes. Um, and you can actually you know, you know, look up the resources here. And here's an example then from the, from the Hedgeter group, um, looking at the architecture of, of the CMC complex, which is very important then for transmembrane insertion into the, into the, uh, in that, the ER. And they saw the structure um, um, of the cryo -EM, and you can see that then they, they knew what the components were, but, you know, and they could, you know, maybe fit in, fit in and they, and they thought, well, you know, this might be the orientation. They solved the crystal structure then of, of two of the components. But to make sure that, you know, this wasn't a crystal artifact and this was actually happening in solution, then they labeled one of the components and then measured the, the binding with increasing uh, concentration of the other component to show that actually it was a real binding thing. So what's in, important then? Well, the important thing is um, the level of binding. You know, ideally you want at least one dipole protein or less. It's important to know what the degree of labeling you have. So, you know, measure the spectrum, account for the dye contribution to your um, solvents of 280. And nanotemper have got a, a little a calculator for that on the website. Um, you know, again, you know, make sure you've got good buffers. Um, you're not getting aggregation. And if you're gonna do, you know, titrations to find KDs, you, you need accurate concentrations. Right, so 
the new software that, that comes with the instrument has it's got a, a very nice range of uh, quality control tests before you kind of start your experiments. You know, one thing is to, is to test whether you're getting binding to the, um, the capillaries and, you know, whether you, uh, you know, have got anything, with, for instance, a variation before or after the MST. And it looks at the MST kind of uh, traces there. Um, so you need to have adequate fluorescence and um, you're typically going to use up um, the, the, the concentration of, of the label material below the KD. And so the two things to look out for, well, one, you know, do you have any absorbance of the label material to the capillary? You get these, these kind of nice then decreases um, center there, doesn't look very good. Um, so you can change capillaries or maybe add, you know, detergents. These detergents here, you could change the buffer, and you know, one way you could kind of you know screen buffers to see you know how good things everything, everything is. Um, or if you if you kind of get traces like this where it gets lumps and bumps in there, then that might might indicate you're getting aggregation here. So you know, centrifuge samples again, detergents might be might be used for passivating agents like VSA or or PEG. Um, you know, if you're using small molecules, you know, is DMSO having an effect? And again, you can then do some buffer screening and seeing, you know, do you get better data? Um, so they also got a binding check where, you know, you've, you've got the label material and you either you know, put the ligand in and, you know, see, you know, are you getting a good signal window or, you know, is really, you know, is everything just a bit too noisy to even be able to get a, a good um, answer before you kind of do a whole, whole titration. And it's important, I think, you know, in all these kind of assays is, is to think about quality control of, of your samples. And again, we're going to talk about that later in the data fitting lecture. Right. So another thing would be, okay, you're going to set up a titration series of the unlabeled material. Just add it one to one to fix concentration of the label. Um, you know, make sure you've got enough time to equilibrium. And then, you know, put it into the, uh, the instrument, check the fluorescence, you know, make sure you've, you've not kind of got some kind of you know, random fluorescence. I mean, that might mean, you know, your cutting is, is a bit out or something else might be happening. In this case here, you can see there seems to be a kind of systematic change as you get, um, an in, you know, a change, uh, increase of the non labeled material. So, you know, is that, is that like independent? Well, you could test that out by say then denaturing the entire system in SDS and seeing, well, you know, is this because you're getting losses of your material because when you're pipetting, it's sticking? Um, or is this a real effect? And of course, if it's a real effect, you could actually, you know, use that to measure the, the KD. Right, so just lastly then, for, for those people um, internally, then I go onto the, the website, look at the biophysics. We've got a um, website, we've got a, a whole range of all the, uh, things about all the different techniques that you can do with, with fluorescence. And we've also got then links to, you know, all the, all the, the different papers we've got. So you can actually look um, to see, you know, well, what, have, what have other people used? Um, and if you've got any questions now, so the first question here in, in the Q&A, then I've got one from Sissy saying, uh, why is there absorption problems for MST, but not uh, DSF? when both of them require capillaries? Well, that's, that's a very, very good question. And I think the difference is, well, one thing is that, that there's there are probably different types of capillary. Um, the other thing would be is, well, because in MST you're labeling um, the, the protein, the component with a large fluoroform, and these are very, very sticky, you know, large hydrophobic groups. You know, it could be that that you know that's causing the, the stickiness. While with the Prometheus and DSF, then you're just looking at intrinsic protein um, fluorescence. And so, you know, unless you've got a very sticky um, protein that's with prone to aggregation, then hopefully you won't see that so much. Two questions here. Another one from Sissy saying, uh, why is fluorescence quenched by by high temperature? Well, I mean, if you if you think about in terms of you're increasing the temperature, so you're increasing the vibrations of everything. So you could get losses then just, just for, you know, initial collisions. Um, um, but also, you know, you, you may then increase, say the, uh, the rate of 
say bleaching as well that was that's, that's something that could happen but yeah so you you know you obviously non weird of ways of of the energy to be dissipated through the system um, anonymous uh, then asks would you have any tips for selecting uh fluorophores for um single molecule threat well i'll 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 i would say you know go and have a look at at the uh, the database and we'll give you a, a whole list of those, I mean, there's there's so many, um, you know, uh, fluorophores now have some very very good properties in terms of, you know, the rate of photo bleaching, you know, that's reduced and they're very bright, um, and they can last for a long time. Um, so, I mean, if we if we kind of talked about uh, single molecule uh, threat, that we've gone for a bit longer, but Chris is going to talk about single molecule techniques later on, and he may he may go into that or may not. Thanks very much for everybody. I think that's it for the day. There's no more questions. Uh, thanks for thanks for coming, and don't forget then to to look on the list and and come to all all the rest of the the talks.